In this video, we're going to be talking about eight things that you need to answer before you start your Airbnb business. So stay tuned. Vacation Rental Machine helps hosts just like you learn how to start, grow, and scale your short-term rental business. This show is all about creating systems that help you automate your business, giving you more time and money freedom. If you're ready to start living the vacation rental life, then subscribe to this podcast today. Come and join us on our Facebook group, The Host Nation, where we'll be talking about starting, automating, and scaling a short-term rental business. Now, on to the show. Hey, welcome back, Coast Nation, to another episode of Vacation Rental Machine. I'm Julian Sage with John Bell. And in this video, we're talking about eight questions that you need to have answered and you need to be very certain with before you start this business. I've seen a lot of people get into this business. They've invested a lot of time, energy, resources, and then they found out, I don't even want to do this. I don't like this. This is not what uh, I signed up for. So we're going to be bringing up some things that you need to answer before you start this business. This really should be the first video that anybody should watch before starting this business. So John, what's the first thing that people should know before starting an Airbnb short term rental business? The first question you want to ask yourself is about the location. Why do people want to come to this property, to this location? Is there a draw outside of the beautiful home that you're going to put together? You want to know this information because this is going to tell you how hard you need to market it. If it's not a city that's very popular, that people automatically are coming to, there's going to be little chances of people wanting to search for your exact destination. So you either have to market it a little different, you have to publicize it on other platforms, or you're going to have to be very strategic in how you get people into your space. So location is very important. Now, of course, we've seen rural places do very well. We've seen urban places do very well. There's a wide spectrum in between that and any type of property that you can actually list. But really what changes is the experience. As you go from urban, the experience can be a little lower. But when you go to those rural markets, that experience that the guest is going to have is going to need to be compounded by something. It just can't be a nice trailer that they're going to come stay in. It needs to either have a view. It needs to have some outdoor activities. You need to think about those things. Right. And being able to find out about your area, if the location uh, is uh, inclined for travelers and what type of travelers are coming to the area. You can definitely use tools like AirDNA, which we've talked about. AirDNA is a market analyzing tool. There's also other tools out there like Price Labs uh, that you can use. But being able to do a little bit of just basic market research, find out, you know, what type of people are coming to the area, you know, what type of properties are they staying in? You can go on Airbnb and look up what are the types of properties just on Airbnb that are maybe in your surrounding area? What do they look like? What do they have in their listing description? What are the things that people are typically going there for? Maybe you're in an area and there's just not enough information. You have to create that. So what do you know if you go and if someone was coming to your area, if you had a friend come up to you and they said, hey, hey, John, you know, what's in what's in your area? Why would I come and stay with you? Maybe it's business. Maybe they're a miner. Maybe they're an oil worker. Maybe they do windmills. Maybe they are a surfer dude. There could be a bunch of different reasons why someone could be coming to your area and there might not be that available information. So you might have to create that. But location, location, location. It is always about location. So, John, what's the second thing that people need to ask uh, themselves uh, when starting this business? All right. Number two is just as important as number one, and it really is about regulations. Now you got the right location that you think you want to make sure that this location allows you to do what you want to do. You're going to have to do some digging and you might have to do some calling around just to make sure that, hey, my location is good. But the regulations are also in favor of what I want to do. And what do we mean by in favor? In favor means either there are regulations passed that you're okay with. There's possibly no major limitation on how many days you can short term rent, or you're comfortable with the number of days that it specifies. For instance, in some markets, they might say you can short term rent only for 190 days on the calendar year. If that is something that you find favorable, that's fine. If you don't find that favorable, if you're thinking that this is a business that you just want to jump in and do and you want to do it year round, think twice. You're going against regulations and you're probably going to get yourself in trouble. Take a deep dive. If you don't see anything, 
Sometimes it's not a bad idea to pick up the phone and call the county or the state to figure out what they have either coming down the pike or if they have anything at all. Right. Another common one that people often forget is zoning. So just because the regulations might say that you are allowed to or that you might not be able to, uh, definitely you have to check with the zoning because the zoning, you know, there's places that are meant for residential. There's places that are meant for commercial. Maybe you're only allowed to get a specific license in a residential zone. Maybe you have to get a different type of license in a commercial zone. Uh, maybe you're in a district that is not uh, zone for a- any of those, you know, being able to find out the zoning is also important. Again, sometimes it can be difficult to find this information. Best thing that you can do is uh, go online. And if that's not there, call up zoning, call up your local uh, city, say, hey, this is my my plan. I want to start this business. Who can I get in contact with? Contact zoning, say, you know, I'm planning on starting this business. What what can I do? And that should give you a little bit more direction as far as if you can start this business or not. All right, John. So me and you, we're, we're both ITs. We're both very analytical. Uh, we both like computers. We both like uh, systems and organization. But not everybody that is that type of mindset, that very analytical, might not really also like communicating or like, um, you know, some some people, some people in our in our community, like they like computers more than they like people. So what's the third thing that people should be asking themselves if they are planning on starting in a short-term rental business? You know, the third question is, are you friendly and welcoming? I think we did this with our first episode of VRM. We asked the question uh, about hospitality versus real estate. And that video is still very true today. You got to be welcoming, friendly, soft, not just so direct. You, You have to be accommodating. You have to be in a sense, emotional at times to deal with some of the things that happen in this business. If you are just this cold machine yourself, just like we're talking about computers and we say, like, computer, do this, and the computer does it, you cannot do that for your guest. Uh, your guests want a softer touch. They want to know they're coming to a, a welcoming home, not just this cold house that doesn't leave anything that thinks of them that doesn't communicate in a way that is pleasant, uh, that doesn't respond to issues quickly, pleasantly, or with some type of emotion behind it. So yes, hospitality, this is really what you need. All right. So John, there's people out there, they look at the numbers, they say, man, this business is profitable. You know, all I need to do is I need to put in some Ikea furniture in this property, and then I'm going to charge a hundred, fifty, two hundred, three hundred dollars a night. I'll, you know, set up some automated messaging. And now it is autopilot cash in my pocket every day. That's not the case though. So what's the fourth thing that people should be asking themselves? Well, uh, yes, Julian, this this happens so often. People think that this is one of those get rich quick type things and they want it to just just do it. They think very little about what they put in and they want the maximum of what they can get out and they don't want to necessarily put in the time. So the question is, are you going to put in the time and the work that's needed to support this business? There is a lot of front loading when setting up a new place. You have to go get it set up. You have to build the furniture or you have to wait for the furniture to get there. There's some design stuff. There's some shopping. There's a lot of time that you're going to put into this apartment originally or this home. And then you got to go on the back end and set things up on the automations and things. This is still hours upon hours of things that need to get done before you can even welcome your first guest. And then you have to deal with the guest. No, it's not a big, you know, time investment when you're thinking about your regular job as far as 80 hours a week, but there is a significant time investment in getting things up and going. So do you have the time and will you put in the work to make this a profitable, scalable business? Right. And there's a lot of people that ask us, you know, John Julian, you know, I'm, I'm working a full time job. I don't have the time. You know, I, I have very limited uh, availability to be able to invest in this business. Can I can I still start doing this? You can as long as you can put in a significant set of hours in the front of setting things up. You're going to have to put in a lot of time finding a place. You're going to have to put in a lot of time setting the place up, procuring all the things that you need to actually put in it. 
put in the time to actually get messaging and things stood up. Could you do this while maintaining a full-time job? I did it for years. Yes, you can do it. I did it this business part-time before making it a full-time thing. However, I still had to dedicate those hours. That wasn't just, hey, I got off at five and I wasn't going to do anything else. I got off at five. I worked from like five to nine, putting in work in this business to build it to where it is. So you either need to do it just like that, knowing that you're going to work long days, or maybe you need to take two weeks off of work just to try to cram the time in there just to get things going. But there is a time investment. And even after you get it all set up, there still is time investing into messaging, into communicating back and forth with guests. It's not as demanding, but it's still there. The biggest annoyance there is it's not necessarily always convenient for you. You might be at dinner. You could be out uh, having a good time yourself and something goes wrong at the property and you need to now give it some attention either by getting somebody remotely there to handle it or you physically doing it yourself. Are you ready for that? That's the question here. Right. And I want to let everybody in on a little secret. We have uh, plenty of students in our group. I d I've never met I never met one person that just said, I have a job, I'm going to quit my job, and I'm, I don't have any experience, and I'm going to start this full time. There's, there's nobody that I've talked to on the podcast, any of our students. Everybody is working very hard. They all have full time jobs. They all have packed calendars, and they're all just trying to chisel out a little bit of time out of their days. So maybe that means you have to spend less time doing things that are more comfortable for you. Maybe you have to wake up a little bit earlier. Maybe you're going to have to stay up a little bit later, but you can do this business if you do have the commitment, which is why, you know, we teach our students how to be able to get their first property in 60 days or less. Uh, we do have students that have gone from zero to over five plus uh, in 60 days. We've had students that came in with one or just three, and now they have over 20. And that can happen within a very short amount of time. But the more time that you make, the more time you should try to also try to chisel back away from your work, allowing you more time to be able to, you know, enjoy uh, some more of the freedom that comes with this business. All right, John. So I love my mother. Um, I'd do anything for her, but I don't always like to answer the phone when my mom calls. Sometimes, you know, I just don't. I don't have the time. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling it. I'm, I'm busy with work, or we're trying to create a podcast. So there's, there's something going on, and you know, sometimes I don't even want to answer because I don't even know maybe what I'll say to my mom. This next question, maybe that was a bad intro. I do, I do love my mother, and I always answer the phone, but. This next question, what should people be asking themselves before they uh, start this business? It definitely has to come down to patience, right? When it comes to the phone ringing, it's one or two things happening. When the phone is ringing, there is money coming in. If you don't pick up the phone, that means money is going out. This is the exact principle that I think of when a guest is calling. When a guest is calling me, they're calling me with something that is possibly resolvable over the phone. If I choose not to answer the phone and just let them go by the wayside, I've compounded their issue. And now they more, more than likely want to receive a refund or they want to get a cancellation on something. So when your phone rings, you need to be able to pick it up. The other test that you will have as a host is people don't treat your place exactly like you treat your place. For instance, if you don't eat in the bedroom, your guests are not going to follow that exact same policy. Same thing with people in shoes. There's some of us that like to take our shoes off at the door. There's some of us who are just like, you know what? These are my shoes. I'm walking in. This is my place. I'm renting it. I'm going to use it how I use it. And guess what? Those shoes go on the couch. Are you patient enough to not explode? When you see somebody doing something like that, when you see the result of something that happened, stains here or there, there are plenty of brand new hosts that I always see just posting in other groups like, hey, this person didn't use the makeup tile. Can I charge them for the tile that they used and messed up? My response to that is no, it is the cost of doing business. We provide these things, but I can't say that this person doesn't follow certain practices when they go home. So how can I say that they must change how they like to live in the place that they have paid for when they come to see me? 
Are you patient enough to deal when the guest calls you at midnight and they say the AC is not working? It's 82 degrees. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to hang up the phone or are you going to at least provide some conversation to try to help ease them into a good night's sleep and a resolution in the morning or some steps that they can do right now to try to get a good result? This is really important. This goes back to the hospitality side of things, but your patience will be tested as a host. All right, John. So what's the next question that people should be asking themselves before starting this business? All right. So the next question is, it's a little personal. Even if it's not you personally, can you pull it off? The question is, are you a clean freak? Your guests are looking for immaculately clean spaces done repeatedly over and over and over again. They are not looking to find a single strand of hair. Is that you? Can you do that yourself or do you need a professional to do it for you? Is your professional professional enough to pull it off? These are the questions you still have to ask yourself. Your guests are going to be very, very, very critical. We've all seen Dateline. They come in with the black light and they're looking around for stains on the sheets and saying, oh, this wasn't changed. One thing that we do is if we had a reservation and we thought that the guests did not stay in a certain bedroom, we don't care. We're going to change the sheets and things anyway. You have to be that anal because I don't know that they didn't. Maybe they are neat freak. Maybe they're good enough to put the bed back the same way that the cleaners placed it. And here we go. We think that it wasn't used and it was used the entire stay. You don't want those unfortunate situations because that is just going to have a pissed off guest. You're going to lose some money and you're going to get a bad review. Right. And with that, I think it's also that attention to detail. Me being a military guy, uh, you know, in boot camp, they would come up to you and they would take little tweezers and they would just they would find a little hair that is maybe sticking out of your uniform and you you would get in trouble for that. It's the same thing with this business. If you're in the bathroom, if you're in the shower and you go to reach for the soap and then you uh, you find that there's some little little hair, a little some hair sticking off the shower thing. And that can be really gross. You wouldn't expect going to a hotel and then finding, you know, hair or mold or these things in these uh, places. It's it's also that attention to detail. All right. So there's no cookie cutter short term rental, the same as there's no cookie cutter uh, hotels or the hotels. They do follow a similar format, but you could go to one hotel like the uh, the Marriott. You could go to another hotel like the uh, Motel 8, and they are going to have a different type of guest, a different type of uh, style, and there's going to be a different price point. So what's the next question, John, that people should be asking themselves before getting into this business? Uh, The question is, do you know your cost versus your expectations? and What that really means is if I go and I go buy that IKEA furniture that we already talked about and I put it in a place, can I charge $700 a night for that place? The likelihood is very unlikely. No, that's not going to work. Your expectations are here. However, you've only invested enough for here. So it's not going to equal up. Your guests are going to rip you apart when they come and stay and say, hey, I paid $700 and I'm back in a dorm room apartment. This is not the place I would recommend for you to stay. I don't care if this is a penthouse. I don't care if this is just like the the villas right on top of the water out in the Maldives. But you have to deliver on what the expectations are, not only for the guest, but just even your price expectations that you even want to sell to your guest. So you got to deliver and you got to Uh, Think about the investment that's needed. If you want $700 a night, you're probably going to be putting in somewhere like $15,000 to $20,000 in furniture. And then that's keeping it light. That's not even really kind of going full expectations. The place that you get needs to be very clean, very modern. You can't be going into like, you know, grandmom's house and it's kind of still beige and it's a little dark and You know, I got the big couch with all the dust that pops up as soon as you sit down. Those places do not come into that price range. You really got to drill down. What can I expect to get from my guest with the stuff that is here? What does it cost for me to get what I want out of my guest as an investment? At the same time, don't expect to be booked 100% of the time. 
100% occupancy is very rare unless you have a month long booking that just takes up the whole month. There's always somebody checking out and somebody checking in and it leaves gaps. So don't come in with that expectation either that, hey, I did my calculations based on 100% occupancy because I'm going to be 100% occupied. No, you're not. Nobody is, right? Somebody's going to check out. Somebody's going to either leave early and leave a little gap. Use that time to definitely make the place better or stay consistent with your photos, uh, with cleanliness and just getting in there and doing what you need to do to prepare for the next guest. Expectations, again, go back to cleaning. Expectations and cost of everything within this business are super important. You can't skimp even on systems that support your business if you want it to run efficiently, automatically, without maximum involvement from somebody. You need something to help and you need to pay whatever that cost is to get there. All right, John, what's the last question that people should be asking themselves? All right, last one, most important one. Every business has risk. Can you handle the risk with this business? I love it when I see people posting on some of our training ads that say, hey, but this is risky. This is this is a little too much. Uh, but what they're not telling you is this. Okay, we all know there's risk with everything that we do. We all drive cars. We go out. And you might be the perfect driver, but it's not about me that I have to worry about. It's about the other people that are around me, right? Anything could happen. Regulations can change in an instant in this business. That could derail. That could detour. That could make you pivot. Acts of God could happen, right? I mean, Houston flooded not too long ago. If you had a, a place there in Houston, it could have flooded. And then your business is kind of underwater, literally. And you want to be able to handle those risks. There's also risk with seasonality. What I see a lot of junior hosts doing is they start making some money. Maybe they're making 3000 a month just in profit off a couple units. And they go out and they buy all this expensive stuff. And now they're just like, oh, this is the life. Low season comes and they go under because they didn't reserve any funds for the low season when you can't necessarily meet all of your obligations that month or the maybe the next month. Maybe you have to put in a few hundred dollars a month. Can you sustain yourself doing that? COVID-19 is one of those prime examples where a lot of companies, even big companies, were failing because, hey, their spendages over the month were really high and they didn't have the income to support or the bank reserves to help cushion their descent down to possibly minimize units, they just went under. One of the last things to really hone in on is, are you covered? Are you covered when the unfortunate thing happens? Yes, something is going to happen. The magnitude of it is what you can control, but you can't stop people from smoking, partying, or breaking something in your space when you give them full access to do so. It's how you mitigate those risks and how you recover from them that's really important. Having the right insurance is one of those things. We actually had a student that just told us, hey, I relied on the host guarantee to actually cover anything that happened to the property and their hot tub was broken. Well, unfortunately, they didn't find out until the next guest checked in, which means the host guarantee is null and void. There is nothing that they're going to get from that policy that is provided by the platform. So you have to do the right thing and cover yourself. You got to have the right insurance. You're going to want to know the steps and things to recover from any damages. You got to be able to still withstand the risk of getting it fixed before getting payout because you do have other people coming in. So you can't deprive the next guest of a feature or amenity that you have in your place just because the glass guest broke it. Nobody wants to hear that. Hey, the last guest broke the washing machine, so you can't wash clothes. Sorry. I hope you understand. No, they don't understand. They want you to fix it. Right. So all of these things are not meant to discourage you from starting an Airbnb business. Of course, John and I are going to tell you all the time that this is going to be a great business. It's changed John's life. It's changed mine. It's changed uh, so many of our students. It's changed all the people from the Success Stories podcast. Um, you know, it's 
it's it's changed my own mother's life. I'm, I'm not kidding you. My own mother has gotten into this business and it's it, it really has changed her life because now she's going to be able to retire from, uh, you know, her work because of short term rentals. And I know that it can change your life as well. So, again, this video is not meant to discourage you uh, from starting this business. But if you do want that extra help, then I definitely recommend uh, you can you can definitely watch all the videos, subscribe to this channel. There's plenty of free resources if you do not have the means to be able to jumpstart your business plethora of information out there. And that's why we provide this to you uh, to be able to help you start and scale your own short-term monthly business. But if you are looking for that support, if you are looking for that extra help, John and I would love to be able to help you. We have our coaching program, which we can definitely help you start and scale your business. We do have a small group of students that we do help uh, personally grow their business. Uh, lots of more training and resources that can really help you jumpstart from uh, zero to 60 days, getting your first rental. We do have students that have gotten five units in their first six weeks. Uh, we have students that have joined with properties and have scaled up to uh, over 20 properties within a short amount of time after implementing the things that we use in our own business. So all of this is meant to help you, but I uh, hope you enjoy. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, Host Nation, keep on hosting. Hey, Host Nation, would you like to work directly with Julian and I to help you start and scale your own short-term rental business? Go to shorttermsage.com forward slash coaching to attend our step-by-step -step training and learn how we can work together. Looking forward to talking to you soon. Hope you hosts found value in this episode. If you did, please go on over to iTunes and leave us a review as that would greatly support the show. If you'd like to connect with John, the community and I, then go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation. Talk to you hosts in the next episode. Keep on hosting.